are we talking about today? Today, we have an incredibly special day. We're going to be talking about risky play and aggressive play. I can't wait. Hi, I'm El Kwan in Hong Kong, and I'm your host of the Hand in Hand podcast. We're a non-profit from San Francisco operating globally, and we decode children's difficult behaviors one parenting challenge at a time. And I'm Abigail Wald, founder of RealtimeParenting.com, and I'm also a certified Hand in Hand parenting instructor. And um, we like to take a look every week at some facet of parenting and how um, Elle and I use the Hand in Hand parenting tools. And we have an amazing guest for you all. Elle, I will let you do the honors. Mm, Thank you. Today we are talking with Dr. Lawrence Cohen. Um, He is a father of two and he's a licensed psychologist specializing in play and play therapy. You might know him because he's the author of the books The Opposite of Worry and Playful Parenting. And he's the co-author of The Art of Roughhousing. And as well as working in his private therapy practice, he also works in schools and daycares with teachers around the world. Um, Larry, welcome to Hand in Hand's podcast for parents. We're thrilled to have you. Thanks, Elle. Thanks, Abigail. Do you know you're a landmark for us? Because you're our very, (laughs) very first guest. Oh, wonderful. So thanks for being our landmark. (laughs) Beyond that, it's really good that we're on a podcast because I'm actually blushing and I'm officially starstruck. (laughs) I just want you to know. (laughs) I am so in love with your work. I, I really, this is thrilling. That's lovely to hear. Thank you. Um, So we're going to talk about two specific types of play that you kind of mentioned, which is the risky play and the aggressive play. Um, And I know to some parents, (laughs) their hearts might be skipping a beat and they might be breaking into a sweat at the sound of those kind of potentially scary subjects. Why did you want to focus on these two styles? Well, it's exactly for that reason that parents are often scared of them and they're actually very, very healthy. They're not just okay, they're actually really developmentally important for children. So what are the two, how would you kind of define both of these? Because they're not the same in one lump. Right, they're different. So we all know what aggression is, uh, but aggressive play is not aggression. Aggressive play is play. So aggressive play is play that has aggressive content, and it could be symbolic, so playing cops and robbers or good guys and bad guys Mm -hmm. or fighting the dragon. It could be play fighting, like roughhousing, playful wrestling, pillow fighting, fall crashing into each other. My boy always wants to lock me in jail. Is that a kind of... Yes. Yeah? I think that's definitely... That's not only aggressive play, that adds another element, which is why this is part of why this is so important, which is the management of aggression. Uh And so games about locking up in jail are symbolically about how do we manage aggressive impulses and how do we deal with the fact that in the world there are people who do dangerous and violent Mm, things. And young children are really trying to make sense of this. And of course... That's not the only reason they do it. They also do it because it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. You know, I have two boys, mm-hmm. and um, I, it was very interesting for me because one of the things that first drew me to hand-in-hand parenting was my older son was incredibly rough with his um, 18-month younger brother when he yep. was a baby. And that was, I think, really not play that was that yeah. was like i'm pissed that there's somebody else here can we talk <laughs> right. about this in fact we don't need to talk i could just throw exactly. him a cock. <laughs> right? exactly. and, and, and it's interesting because right. it's been a huge learning curve for me to um not just allow their play but to really embrace their play and i will say the art of rough housing was really important for me oh good um, um, yeah exactly yeah. because if we just say don't do that don't do that where do those aggressive impulses go? What does a yeah. child do with them? They either think, I'm bad, but I still have this aggressive impulse. Yes. Or they think, you don't get it. You don't understand me, which creates a disconnection. But if instead we say to ourselves, let's take this aggression and make it symbolic. Let's make it playful. Let's get out a doll and say, oops, the baby fell into the hot lava. What are we going to do? Um, 
<laughs> and you might not want the 18 month old to watch this game. <laughs> but nobody's getting hurt. I have so many, so many parents, especially moms, I'd say, because most moms didn't grow up with this kind of play, that say, I couldn't do this. It's, I'm a pacifist. It's like, mm. well, you know, actually, this is plastic. Mm. Oh, you know, you, you bring up such a good point. It's so interesting. Um, I was just listening to Michael Gorian speak about, uh, you know, the brain science between male brains and female brains, right? And about how yeah. girls hold dolls and look at dolls and think like, you know, oh, this is like a chance for me to practice connection and relationship, right? And mm-hmm. like this, this doll is real. And then moms see the boys pick up the doll and typically just like thrash it about and break it apart and figure out how it works <laughs> and can be horrified and think like, oh my gosh, he's a psychopath, right? But yeah. for the boy, he's just like looking at it mechanically and kind of looking at us like, um, you guys do know this is plastic, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yes, I hear I hear parents all the time saying you, you're going to hurt that stuffed animal's feelings. It's like, well, actually not. Yeah. And the the problem is that we have gotten into this idea that because children learn through play, we should be teaching them something every moment that they're playing, mm-hmm. whether it's teaching them the color of the truck and how many wheels it has instead of just playing with the truck or teaching about social and emotional things like be nice and gentle with the doll. It's like, no, we want them to be nice and gentle with people. And that might involve being kind of rough with the doll. Mm. So how does it transfer into the real world then? You know, we were just talking there about this is aggressive play. Is it an active way to help handle a child's aggression or are we merely observers watching them work this out? How, where's the balance? Well, I think that the, the key element is a human connection right. and that children who are just smashing things and they're seeing red and they're not in any kind of connection with anyone, this is just a pure aggression and it it feeds itself. It's not releasing, it's not freeing them up. But if they're laughing and they're engaged with their play and they're engaged with their peers, they're engaged with you, then this is actually the deepest kind of learning about managing aggression. Mm. Mm. Okay, I love that. And I I wanna just shift and talk a little bit about risky play and how that's Mm. different. Mm. Um, so the essence of risky play is children determining their own level of risk. And this is very hard for parents. We have kind of shifted dramatically from go outside, whatever, who cares to, oh my gosh, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Um, we have to pad all the furniture and, Mm. And we have to have adult supervision every moment and not just adult supervision, but adult managing and structuring every moment. And in fact, children need to exercise that ability to find their own level of risk. And so I've really evolved with this very recently where I always thought, oh, risky play is when you climb a tree or when you yeah, jump really far. Yeah, I was immediately far. thinking there was that in the news recently where some guy had just built this mm. like amazing big tree and sand it in his garden and right. they were just allowed to go wild kind of thing. And that does right. sound, well, where are the boundaries? You're saying yeah, it doesn't have but, to be that. Well, right, because risk is also the child who sees that sand pit and tree and says, I'm gonna just play over here on the side and watch. Mm. Okay, that child is doing important work on risk. And mm. it's a it's equally a problem if we don't let children who are ready to climb just climb as far as they know they can. That's a problem because they need to they need to know inside. They can't we can't tell them. Mm. They have to figure mm. that out. Mm. And it's just as big a problem to say to the other child, "No, you have to go do that. Everybody's climbing the tree. You have to be risky." Well, no, the key is not how big a risk you take in terms of danger. The key is that the children are in charge of determining their own risk, and that's really where the safety comes from. So in both mm. of these cases, you're really talking about them kind of taking charge of their play. Absolutely. 
I, I love this. Yeah, it's so interesting. <laughs> that can to be me. so hard, can't it? <laughs> yeah. So there's one of my favorite stories about the aggression play was a mom who was very desperate, waving her hand in the air. She had a question, an urgent question. And the question was, my son's favorite game is pulling the heads off of his action figures and throwing them down the stairs and making explosion noises. <laughs> and so um, I played dumb. I, I learned this from Patty Whipfler, the, the happy, dense person. I smiled and I said, what's your question? And of, of course I knew her question was how to get him to stop playing this horrible, violent game. So I, I said, you're not going to like this, but um, I think my recommendation is to play the game with him. Yeah. And she was shocked and horrified. I couldn't possibly. It's so violent. It's like, no, this is the difference. This is the key difference. It's not violent. It's yeah. symbolic. It's like, do you ever go read Shakespeare or go to a Shakespeare play? Have you ever read the Bible? It's like... We're talking about symbolic violence, like beginning to end, right? It's yeah. it's healthy. It's normal. And yeah. so if you join in, then you could say, oh, Frankie, your head came off. We've got to get the medics and get your head back on. We've been through so many battles together. You're my best friend. <laughs> well, now you've introduced themes of friendship, rescue, and loyalty, it's taken you three seconds to introduce those themes, and they're now integrated into the play because you joined in. But if you yelled from the other room, stop that horrible game and play a game about friendship and loyalty and rescue, yeah, your son would have no idea what to do with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so powerful. That is just so powerful. And it's so interesting for me because um, my older son... Um, was born needing multiple open heart surgeries. And mm. so he was very, um, <laughs> there's literally, <laughs> so funny. There's literally a picture of me. I have no idea how this happened. Uh, I All I can say is I live in Los Angeles. There was a point where somehow there is a picture of me holding my baby in a tub of pasta. I, I don't know what to say <laughs> about this, okay? It was some experiential experience. I just remember he was horrified. This was before I had found ha- Hand in Hand. And yeah. Um, and you know, you were go bathing him in pasta. No, like all these babies were like in pasta. It was very strange. I don't know. So, um, <laughs> so that is a trend. The pasta spot. I like it. <laughs> and uh, and my son was very reluctant to do anything for a very long time, and yeah. it actually did cause anxiety in me, right? Mm-hmm. And and among mm-hmm. all the things that caused anxiety in me at that point, before I was really like mm-hmm. able to manage all that. Um, and uh, and it's really interesting because it's been such a journey for both of us to learn this risk and this risk yeah. management. And there's places where he's risky and places where he's actually incredibly cautious. And yeah. um, and so, you know, learning to walk by his side, and this is also my son who's been the more aggressive one, um, mm-hmm. who, uh, you know, almost also seemed to have like proprioceptive sort of um, boundary learning right where he would really need mm-hmm. to like it took him 2 years to be able to pet the dog without her wanting to bite him you know yeah. and um and it was fabulous because it's been such an incredible beautiful journey to walk along and so healing mm-hmm. and interestingly when he i just took him to train the dog the dog has been the source of many good things mm-hmm. and i took him to train the dog and um at the training session, the guy who was training had a skateboard and threw the skateboard down to make sure that the dog was okay with it. And of course, my son was like, skateboard? And, um, and spent the entire hour of dog training skateboarding uh-huh. and teaching himself how to skateboard. No helmet, nobody watching him. We're all doing the dogs. And I just said to myself, you know what? He's got this. That's and great. came home and my husband was like, no way, which is hilarious because my husband is a cyclist, right? Uh-huh. And I just sort of looked at him like, really? <laughs> <laughs> really, right. Mr. Cyclist? <laughs> and, yeah. and so I bought him a skateboard for his 11th birthday. And, you know, it's fascinating. Yeah. And it's taken me a long time to get there. Well, I, I heard something very profound from a teacher. And this was at um, a school in in China that I was visiting. And as a, as a school's in Anji County, A-N-J-I, you can look it up angiplay.com. Mm. I spent a week there and it was fascinating. And they are the experts on risky play in the world, as far as I know. <laughs> but I heard a, a, a teacher gave a presentation and she was filming some students 
these are three and four year olds and they were playing on a kind of a homemade swing and they were adding more and more children onto it and so it was getting a little bit unsteady and her first thought was do i need to step in and so this is the first thing instead of automatically stepping in to ask yourself do i need to step in mm. and what i one thing i learned from them was if you're a little worried step closer but with your hands down and your mouth closed mm. okay because mm. we rush to say be careful don't do that and but we can move a little closer so in case something goes wrong we're there and the, the most profound thing she said was they were taking a risk with exploring in this kind of play and so i decided I need to also take a risk and let them explore this play. Oh, mm. yeah. It's working on both sides. Well, what do you I do then if, so you, if you are nervous or, you know, you're tired or you, yeah. you, know, you weren't played with in this way and you don't have that kind of play vocabulary? Yeah. How do you ease well, in? How do you set it up? Right. There's no substitute for e two things. One is listening partnerships mm. and... I would say, don't just talk about it. Okay. Okay. A lot of us in listening partnerships, we um, we do a lot of talking, but I would say, actually do something. You know, actually climb a tree in your listening partnership, mm. and have your listening partner say, "Oh, be careful, be careful, be careful," <laughs> until you laugh about that, or say, "You've got this, go for it," um, and. Um, oh, it really I have the hugest smile on. on my face right now. Oh, okay. Abigail's so getting her skateboard then, out any minute. <laughs> 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 and the other thing is to have a friend um, to um, to do special time with you. Um, this made a huge difference for me. I, you know, I I shouldn't admit that, but I was terrible at doing special time. Mm -hmm. I would do. I would drop it i would forget it i would not do it for months at a time we've done a whole but episode had... on breaking the rules oh, good. Time. Yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> we feel you no so, <laughs> good good so but when i had a friend who came and did special time together with us um. i could it took this load off my shoulders and mm. i could watch somebody else who was bolder in those kind of physical things and i would watch them and they were not freaking out about what the child is right. doing it's like oh well they, wait a minute they're not freaking out um i remember once at a family workshop the kids all wanted to go out on this there was a raft and there's a little pond and it was tied to the to the side i thought it was fixed there but the kids are like this comes off we could float off with this <laughs> and i'm about to say i'm about to say no way you know, the water was freezing and these kids were little, you know, and, and one of, this is supposed to be special time though, right? So right. one of the other dads says, oh, well, let's see how that would work, you know, very calmly. And I was able, you know, and it, it took a lot of work for me to get there because I was an anxious kid and an mm. anxious dad, but I was able to, to tune in to this other dad, calm, his calm, I was able to tune into the children's excitement and the somewhere inside a sense of trust in them and to quiet the screaming voice in me, which was, no way, this is terrible, get out of here, this is off limits. Um, and so that's the goal. There's no magic way to get there. I think it's practice. And the children did not float off. No one, yeah. So they they <laughs> they they paused when the other when the when the other dad was very calm about it, and said, "Oh, what do we need to do?" They figured it out. They was like, mm. "Oh, we better have a pole," and so they went looking for a pole. And they so we better leave somebody on the shore in case we don't come back, so somebody can go get help. You know, they figured all that out. That's amazing. Mm. I love that. And how old were those kids? They were six and seven, I think. Six, seven, eight. Yeah, it's so interesting. Even I feel like three and four year olds can have super clear thinking around stuff like that. Oh, and absolutely. When they're when they're allowed to, when we get out yeah. of their way and they're in charge of the risk. Yeah. Um, in charge of determining their own level of risk. That was one of my um, big things was to learn to stop saying like, "Well, be careful because this thing could break." Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And to start saying. 
oh, well, that looks really cool. I'm wondering how we're going to keep this thing stable. Yeah. You know, yeah. like to start looking forward in like the positive way. Do you exactly. know, like towards what we want instead right. of what we're afraid of. Inviting the reflection. Right. Yeah. And I think there's another step, which I'm not all the way there yet, which is, Wow. <laughs> Period. <laughs> I'm not there yet, Larry. Okay. <laughs> Me neither. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. What about um? <laughs> what about if you don't have a history of playing this way with your child? How do you? What yeah. would be some first moves to kind of get this play kind of going? Well, let let me say to introduce my answer to that. Uh, this is something I was thinking when you were telling the skateboard, when Abigail was telling the skateboard mm. story, was um, this is a dance. What you were describing with the, you know, the the helping you, encouraging your son to take risks and being willing to allow risks and all this stuff, this is a dance. And that, um, and good roughhousing is more like dancing than like fighting. And... Hmm. So this is one thing to keep in mind if we're not used to it, is that it, if, because a lot of roughhousing is play fighting, you think fighting, but no, it's actually much more like dancing. You have to tune into one another. So I like games that really focus on the tuning in process. And so one of my favorites is called force field hands. Mm -hmm. So you put your hands out with your elbows bent and then the other person puts their hands out with their elbows bent and your hands are almost touching. Now, young children and impulsive children will skip this step, okay? <laughs> but I'll, I'll walk you through the steps anyway. That's fine. They'll skip this step. First, the hands are almost touching. I watched a lot of Star Trek as a kid. So <laughs> this is the force field. And you feel, and, and usually you can feel like a warmth or mm. tingling between mm. your hands. And this is because you're really tuning in to one another um, at a deep level. And then... You try to push the other person's hands back and forth using only the force field space between you. Mm. So if you can imagine that. And when you start to push a little bit, wow, you really start to feel the energy field between you. Mm. That's step one and two. The next step is you touch hands and you press and you slowly increase the pressure and you match each other's pressure. And so you end up after a few seconds even, just pushing quite hard, but nobody's going anywhere. Because it's not how hard can I push, it's how much can I match the other person's pressure. Mm. And again, it's a deep, deep tuning in. And one important skill for parents is tuning in to our children's pace and rhythm and intensity. Mm. It's so hard for mm. mild, mild parents who have highly intense kids. Mm -hmm. All right, this is or vice versa right? yeah. <laughs> so yeah. then you add the next step is you add a little level of competition and so you push and you you maybe have a circle you have to push the person out of the circle or out of the room um, and as always you know I'm sure you've talked about this before your goal is to make your child work for it but in the end they, they generally win because you want to have them build up confidence mm, absolutely yeah and you ham it up. You'll never get me out of here. You'll never, never, never. And um, so this is pushing hands and force field hands. And it's a great entry point. Um, I love that. A another favorite of mine for, for parents who are reluctant is the sock game. And the sock game is you have no shoes on and you have socks on and you get on the floor and you put your feet out together one, two, three, go, and you try to get everybody else's socks on and keep get everybody else's socks off and keep your own socks on. Yes, this was one of our and favorites. It is a laugh fest. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we, it's such a great I one. totally felt like I had no idea how to play. And when I kind of was looking into this and found hand in hand, I was like, immediately, I was like, what can I play? What can I play? Uh -huh. And the sock game was one of the first. And just, it's undeniable good fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then the last thing I guess it really I should have said at first it's the most important is your children are experts in play. You don't have to be. Mm. Yeah, you do what they do. <laughs> yes. All right. Yes. So there was this boy. He his mother had called me in a panic because she said she heard me give a lecture on connection and the importance of connection. She called me in a panic. He can't connect. There's something deeply wrong with him. 
So I was like, okay, that sounds serious. So I went over to their house and he's jumping on his bed. He was about six years old. And I said, hey, let's you and me connect. And he doesn't use that language, that's my language. So I said, we could shake hands or high five or bow to each other or tell a joke. So he gets off his bed, he gets two Lego men, little Lego men, and he hands one to me. And I don't know what's going on, but I take it because I'm following his lead. And then he puts the arms out on his Lego man. Mm. So I don't know what's going on, but I put the arms out on my Lego man. And then he holds his man out, and I hold my man out, and our Lego men shake hands with each other. Oh, my God, that's so Aww. sweet. I know. That's what I thought. And the mom was like, you see what I mean? He can't connect. And, um, but, you know, because her idea of connection was you sit at the table, and you talk about your day, and you talk about your right. feelings. Right. And it's yeah. like, well, you didn't get a boy like that. There are some. You didn't get yeah. one. I'm sorry. But, but really, it's, it's following his lead. And... I didn't know what this, I didn't know how to play with him. Um, I didn't know what he was into. I I figured out that he needed some less intensity because his mom was very, very intense. So the other thing he did was I asked him to connect with his mom and he got off the bed and he turned his back to her and walked away from her. She was sitting down and I thought, this is a little odd. And then he starts going beep, 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 like a truck backup noise and backs up into her lap. But with his back to her, that was how I thought too. Um, But the mom's just so fixed on this one type of connecting was, you know, talking and deep talks. and, And she missed that. No, this kid wants to connect by playing truck and mm. playing Legos and, and being a bit less intense. <laughs> you know, I need to say, uh, this was a journey for me too, honestly. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I need to come clean and say, <laughs> my first couple of years, that was hard for me. Yeah. And that was a huge learning curve um, to realize that there was nothing wrong with my son. And the first time I heard Patty say that, I was like, what do you mean? You know, <laughs> right. like, but I'm sure there is, right? Yeah. And um, right. and uh, it just brings tears to my eyes even just mm. now thinking about it. And mm. it was really about my and, and and I think that's really parenting, right? It's this journey into humility. You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like talk about Star Wars. It's like it's mm-hmm. epic, and um, you know, it's it's really just this huge journey into humility and like. Um, you know, understanding that that it is all about listening, right? I mean, to go back to yep. Patty's work and to yours, and and how can we listen? And and uh, you know, I'm I'm being flooded with so many um, things as you're talking, even from my own childhood. Mm. There was a time when, um, I, you know, I was supposed to go horseback riding with a bunch of other people at camp, and I was mm-hmm. very very small. And they decided not to let me on the horse at the last mm. minute, and everybody else got to go on the horse, and they thought I couldn't manage the risk. Yeah. And it was devastating for me. Right. Like, devastating for years afterwards, and really deeply affected me. And mm. it, it, it shook me to the core. And I, I want to say this because I think it's really important that we understand that when we don't ch- like trust a child's own ability to handle their own risk, that child can stop trusting themselves. Yeah. And well, yeah. that's important. Well, I had a, a experience that this reminds me of as a parent when, when my daughter Emma was about three, she was climbing on this climbing structure and I was at the bottom saying, be careful, be careful, be careful. Mm. And my friend who was at the park with me came over and said, you know, Larry, she's going to recover better from a broken arm than from being timid and fearful her whole life. Mm. And, you know, my friend very nicely didn't say, like you, Larry, <laughs> um, which, which would have been true, but it, it, it helped me to take it in, you know, to not be defensive. And I really had to acknowledge the truth of that. Yeah. And it, it stunned me, and I really took it yeah. to heart. And... You know, now, I mean, a, f- a couple of years ago, she climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, you know, and there's like a hard way and a harder way. And she went up with her group the harder way, you know, mm. it's like, so wow. um, I was proud of her, of course, but I was kind of proud of myself <laughs> that I had learned how to, to, to quiet that, what I thought, always thought of as 
was as protective, but really quiet it um, as wait a minute, this is this is anxiety that has no no real place in reality. Yeah. Not that a person can't fall, sure. Yeah. But yeah, and they'll I, fall, they'll get up. I have one other question for you. Do you think any of this, it just occurs to me as we're talking about it, you know, it's like in modern society, there are, we're so sheltered for those first few years and then we get out mm. and it's almost like more crazy than it would have been, you know? Mm. And I think, um, you know, sort of if you go back 100, 200 years, I imagine there would have been so many more opportunities to test our own selves and our own skills and our balance physically and, uh, um, you know, in in so many ways. Yeah. And, and so now it's like we're kind of letting our kids prepare less and then sending them out into this world that's kind of more, do more. Um, erratic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. I think we have... It's it's related to the nature deficit that most children mm -hmm. have the 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 work you know the kind of hands on work you know it, so many people today they can't relate to what their parents do mm, for work yeah. mm -hmm. um, and and then we we think about housework as chores and so it's so funny three year olds don't make any distinction between play and chores and then they learn it quickly from us like Ugh, this is horrible <laughs> this is drudgery this is chores and then we then we have to yell at them to clean their room yes. Um, yes, right. we don't know why they don't want to clean their room yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah i think these are all interconnected and um yeah the 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 opportunities are there we you know, it's it's just yeah, right outside the door, or in your ice box. Yeah. My, uh, yeah, one of my kids' favorite things is I will do like um, we don't tickle, you know. Oh, we've yeah. talked about this before, right? But we'll do tickle fights where yeah. we get on either end of the bed, and we'll uh, they'll come and attack me, yeah. and then they'll like come behind me and get me in like a jujitsu hold and kind of like try to tickle me till I you know tap out. Yeah, um, or we'll take ice cubes and throw it down each other's pants <laughs> and then like torture each other wonderful that is what yeah. i've yet to play <laughs> you're a brave right. woman <laughs> oh dear oh thank you so yeah. much i think that's been a really beneficial conversation for me for sure um and Good. for everyone Oops. listening is there anything else you know we should have asked you that you wanted to say and you haven't mm. Um, I'd say just jump in, dive in and notice the resistance and find somebody to talk about it with later, but don't let that resistance stop you because, uh, the, the reason I started rough housing with my daughter was because I saw other people doing it and having so much fun and her having so much fun and I was scared of it and I just saw the fun and I think I don't want to miss out on this mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's so beautiful and that brings up one last question is you know um, I know I'm, t I'm talking about boys because I have boys but this goes across gender lines right absolutely so can you just address that really quickly before we cut out maybe yeah well my shorthand for the you know, we could talk for hours about all the gender stuff, but I, the my shorthand for this is that all children need both roots and wings. They need roots to feel connected and interconnected, and they need wings to fly and explore and discover. And our society is much better at giving the roots to the girls and the wings to the boys. Mm -hmm. And so we need, it's not that we switch that, it's that everybody needs both. And so... We need to put some effort with our boys into building connection into the um, the exciting play, um, not getting rid of the exciting play, uh, but building the connection into it. And with our girls, we need to really encourage the the discovery and independence and pushing the limits. And I guess I'd have to say we've. I think in general, the last 20, 30 years, we've done a better job expanding this for girls than for boys. 
Mm, mm, mm. So in the United States, we have Title IX, you know, since the 70s. So the, and this has made an enormous difference. Girls' access to sports and athletics has made an enormous difference in the confidence of girls and women. But we don't have this emotional Title IX for boys as much where it's okay to have a doll and nurture it and mm. um, or to you know say I love you to your friend you know um, or to take the doll's head off and then yeah. reach down <laughs> the <laughs> stairs <laughs> right. Right. I'll leave I'll, I'll, I'll leave with a funny story which yeah. is I, I had my kids they had gone um, my boys had gone to like an event where they were given two little stuffed animals Mm-hmm. And uh, they're driving home, and on the drive home, they uh, it, it, actually, I'm sorry, no, like this was two days later on the drive to school. <clears throat> they start, like, I hear one of them go, <laughs> You could pull its head off. <laughs> and then the next thing I know, they're like collecting all the polystyrene beads in the inside, and they're like, We can make slime with this, make yeah. a factory. <laughs> and then they take the, the um, cotton out, and they're like, What do we do with the cotton? I don't know, we'll figure something out, put that here. And now there's like this whole factory, and then mm-hmm. they, they're like, Oh, you could pull the wing off, right? Yeah. And like I hear this whole thing, and by the time I get to school, I get handed a water bottle with like parts of stuffed animals yeah. inside it, like Silence of the Lambs, and they look at me and they go, "Freeze this!" Oh. <laughs> it's like, all right, guys, yeah. see you later. Yeah. yeah, destruction and creation. It's all one thing. Yeah. <laughs> So funny. Oh, thank you so much. Destruction. Oh, it's been a pleasure. (laughs) We'll take that with us. Um, For anyone that's listening and has been inspired to get into more play and do some more aggressive play and risky play, um, your books are fantastic for this, aren't they? They're they're great resources. We can link to those. Um, You've got playful parenting and the art of roughhousing. Great ideas in there. Mm -hmm. The opposite of worry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the opposite of worry is not just about our children's fears and anxieties, but our own also. Yeah. <laughs> We're all wrapped up together in it, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, and as ever, if you can rate and review us, we would love that. And if you have any questions about play, um, either this aggressive play, the risky play, or any kind of play that your kids are playing at home, do drop us a line and let us know. We would love to hear from you. Definitely. And we can also leave a link to, um, uh, we have five games to play in five minutes or Mm, under. So if you feel like there's not enough time, um, we got you covered. Because there isn't enough time. (laughs) But you can still do a lot of good stuff in five minutes or under. You can. (laughs) Oh, thanks so much, uh, Lawrence. It was just a pleasure having you on. Absolutely. And do us a favor, please, if you're enjoying our podcast, go on and leave us a review and a rating. Uh, We really enjoy that. And uh, that's it. Let us know. You can always write to us with your ideas, too, of what you want us to talk about. Yes, absolutely. If you want to find Abigail uh, and work with her at Real Time Parenting, there is a link in the show notes, or you can get in touch with her at realtimeparenting.com. We are actually going to be taking a week off. So we will see you guys next on April 10th. 10th. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you're celebrating Passover, Abigail, and we're doing Easter here in Hong Kong. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you guys on the 10th. <laughs>